Welcome back to Introduction to Computational Fluid Dynamics, CFD. I'm your professor, Steve Miller. Today we'll be starting a new module, Visualization and Extraction, that is, the post-processing phase of computational fluid dynamics. Previously, we had a whole module on numerics. We looked at all types of discretization schemes, time advancing schemes, linear algebra, nonlinear solvers, differences between steady and unsteady solutions, and many other interesting topics. Once we've gone through all the hard work of defining the problem, defining boundary conditions, selecting equations, discretizing them, solving them, ensuring we have convergence, performing grid independent studies, now we have the luxury of entering the third phase of CFD, which is the post-processing phase. That's, of course, visualization. In this class, we'll have a general outline of visualization. We'll discuss some best practices. We will give an overview of how data might be extracted. We'll talk about qualitative versus quantitative techniques. And finally, we'll outline some contemporary challenges of visualization itself, which could be a whole area of development and research, which many students get very excited about. Let's look at a few examples of visualization from one excellent group at the NASA Langley Research Center who developed the fully unstructured Navier-Stokes three-dimensional code, FUN3D, from NASA. This, of course, is from one of their training slides, which you can find online if you're interested in reading about how they developed their code and how they visualize some of their results. I believe that all these results shown in this slide were made with a piece of commercial software, which was used to interpret the data that their solver, Fun3D, created. Simply put, let's look at some interesting examples on this particular slide. On the upper left, we have a wing, so they're able to show the geometry of the wing, and they're showing contours of vorticity in the cross-stream direction. They've combined this plot with streamlines going over this um, tip of the wing. So in some plots, you can combine multiple types of visualization techniques to try and tell a story. In the lower left, we have the same type of plot, the same wing lined up, but of course we have contours of um, the pressure coefficient on the boundary of the airfoil. In the upper plot, we have essentially the same type of CFD solution, but we're showing something that's more quantitative in that we're plotting on the x-axis, the distance from the leading and trailing edge of the airfoil, and with the pressure coefficient. Notice that they've correctly placed negative pressure coefficient on the positive y-axis. They've also showed a slice of the domain. This way, people can directly line up where the pressure coefficient is on the blade with the exact x-axis to find corresponding pressure, pressure coefficient. This is a pretty good plot. On the right, they've shown something that looks similar to a wind turbine blade. Here's the, um, the pole, which it sits on, and then there's two blade elements that are swirling around. And they've plotted isosurfaces of some quantity. This might be called Q-criterion, and they've colored the Q-criterion with some pressure contours. We'll talk about these plots later in these classes. In the lower part, they've combined both a flow field and on-surface visualization. So these gr white and gray and black uh, contours are Schlieren, that is gradients of density, and on the vehicle surface, of course, they put contours of what is likely some kind of pressure. You'll see that maybe some of these plots are more for just visualizing flow. They have not put on contour legends. You should always try and put in contour legends so that you can quantitatively understand the values of the contours. Let's now introduce some basic concepts. We'll define what visualization is. Visualization is the graphical or other representation of a solution for the understanding of the physics and implication of the results. That is, it is a way of understanding our solutions derived from the CFD solver. We have only the most basic data from the CFD solver. That's typically the field variables. Sometimes we ask our solver to also calculate other quantities. That's probably more rare. Instead, all the quantities of interest of, from the CFD solutions are usually derived after the fact. That is, from the solution data files themselves, which only contain the field variables. If we want to find some sort of value or other type of quantity, we would need to extract it from the data. One might be drag. How do we extract drag from the data? How do we extract certain like flow structures or quantities? This is the process of extraction. And extraction is the process that derives 
quantitative or qualitative flow physics from CFT solutions. We'll define what quantitative and qualitative are and show examples in this class. Typically, the extraction process is completely automated based on the CFD. They could have integrated it with a larger code, and there's many companies and free software that also provides visualization capabilities as standalone programs. And they all have built-in functions, for example, finding vorticity. Now, these are some examples of many tools in post-processing phases CFD. And for a researcher, they are made to examine and understand the particular results. Now, visualization and extraction are typically accomplished by displaying the results in various types of plots. And we showed some examples, and we'll show a lot more in the future. And these are derived by so-called mathematical functions. Now, mathematical functions, as an example, might just be something like vorticity. Typically, codes do not directly output vorticity. In contemporary codes, they can, but you're using more memory. It's much better to calculate things like vorticity in the post-processing phase. This is where they're typically accomplished traditionally for the regions, reasons of very limited computer memory. For very, very, very large high-performance calculations, you'll find it to be very difficult to calculate the arrived quantities during and within the solver itself. This, of course, you're limited by memory and CPU power. Now, I find one of the most enjoyable aspects of computational fluid dynamics is visualization. It is so much work to create a grid, run a solver, and go through the whole process and find a converged solution for sometimes even the simplest cases. It's a very much a great joy to finally open up and see the results and plot them as contours or find other interesting ways to visualize the results. Unfortunately, it's also sometimes the most frustrating, and there's a number of rule reasons for that, and it's usually because of something with the capabilities of the software. Now, thankfully today, there's many, many contemporary tools available on the market to examine visualization, and they represent entire post-processing systems. Examples from, say, the commercial community which you would have to pay for these software, would be TechPlot. TechPlot is one industry leader. A similar um, uh, code is called FieldView. These are both designed to read many different kinds of safety solutions and represent standalone software, which you would buy on your own, and they produce amazing plots. The plots which I showed from NASA were all done in TechPlot. There's other types of visualization software which is just simply built into the commercial software package itself. For example, if you purchase a Star CCM yearly license from the company uh, Siemens, then of course it will come with a grid generation package, it will come with solvers, and of course it will come with a visualization software. It is all integrated seamlessly, and you won't even know particularly that you're in one part of the process or the other. It's an integrated approach. This is very typical for simulations, which of course are running um, you know, on desktops and large systems, and it can run on most desktops. This is very much like Fluent, which is another example of an excellent piece of commercial software. These are also integrated, they're post-processors, and they make it extremely easy to do. Why? Because the solver and its data are directly integrated and ready to load by the visualization software. Traditionally, and with most research groups, the solver, grid generation, and visualization system are three separate programs. So if your solver finishes, it writes the solution data to a file, and it's then up to the visualization software to be able to read that file and its format, and of course, load it up and correctly display the data. Unfortunately, this is a very difficult process to master sometimes because you have to know everything about your file formats. If you've written your own solver, you'll have to write your data into a format that can be read by your chosen visualization system. This can be automated for some well-established solvers, for example, like Fun3D. Now, the results will often be time-dependent and three-dimensional. They have to be examined on 2D surfaces. Why? Because our computer screens are two-dimensional. We have to take three-dimensional evolving data in space-time and somehow project it onto a computer screen or a piece of paper for a journal article that would be published, or perhaps it's being in a presentation on a projector. These are all examples of what visualization software does really well. It takes three-dimensional data and projects it onto two dimensions 
for the use of, of course, visualization, understanding the results. There's, of course, three-dimensional ways to do this with virtual reality, which is an emerging field for understanding three-dimensional data. It's been examined for 30 or 40 years of how to use virtual reality with three-dimensional time-evolving data, but unfortunately, it just hasn't caught onto mainstream. You'll see in some research organizations, they might have a VR room where they actually show and use this type of technology. Now, it's easy to miss or misinterpret the results, it's easy to fall in the trap of making them appear aesthetically pleasing. What I mean by that is many students sometimes spend a lot of time looking at color maps and adjusting figures and um, trying to make the plots look maybe uh, interesting or aesthetic. That is not the goal of CFD. Of course, the goal of CFD and visualization is somehow to present the information in the most simple way so that it's understood. You, as a student, a new user, I recommend concentrating on finding quantifiable, useful information from the CFD data, no matter what the data set is, and understand what your reader or viewer, that is you or perhaps a supervisor or colleague or someone in your research organization might want to really understand. It's just like writing a paper. You need to understand your audience. Now, visualization, like the solver, is an imp implementation of the discrete mathematics and algorithms, and therefore it contains the same numerical errors that were in CFD. For example, if you're finding derived quantities like vorticity, you're actually finding a discre discretized form of the equation for vorticity and then applying it to your CFD data. This actually could introduce new errors that were not in the solution, but are only present in the visualization process. Another example is if your CFD solver is high order, like fifth order accurate, and your visualization software is only using second or first order derivatives. You're now using accuracy in the visualizations. Furthermore, there's a loss of accuracy when it's moved to the screen. The screen has a finite number of pixels, and so it's very much possible that there's some loss of the visualization accuracy with that respect too. I would like to read a quote from the book on Introduction to CFD by Cummings who wrote this book at the United States Air Force Lab. Let's read it together. As the CFD solutions produced more and more information, it was no longer possible to fully sift through all the results using simple approaches. For example, a structured three-dimensional grid for viscous flow computations with one million grid points will produce at least six million pieces of data for every time step. That is density, velocity, pressure, and temperature at every point. If the flow is unsteady, and you are computing in time accurate mode with a fairly small time step, you can easily have hundreds or thousands sets of data to comprehend at the same time. That could mean you would need to understand billions or more pieces of information in some logical straightforward way. This is why flow visualization is so important. And this challenge today is becoming more and more prevalent because the rate at CFD data is growing from simulations is becoming much, much faster than, of course, the ability to visualize the data. And so we have to become smarter and smarter about how we take these data sets that are terabytes or more in size at the time of this video in 2020, then, of course, it will be harder and harder to visualize and load it up in the computer. It's very unlikely that you can download a CFD data set from a supercomputer onto your laptop or personal machine and put it in RAM. For example, if the visualization software wants to load up the entire data set in RAM, it's likely impossible that if your computer has only maybe 16 gigabytes of RAM, which is typical in 2020, that it's going to be able to load up a data set that's two to three terabytes in size. It just won't fit in the RAM. And so the visualization software and you as a user are going to have to make careful choices on how to proceed. You're only going to be able to load up portions of the data set in RAM, or you'll have to do operations directly on the disk, which is very computationally expensive relative to doing them into the RAM of the computer. Let's now talk about the visualization process itself. Now, typically the output from a computational fluid dynamics code are going to be the density, the momentum terms, or velocity, and some kind of energy, and maybe a derived quantity or two if you tell the solver. But that's not really best practices, in my opinion. There are typically the only variables known at the end of the simulation. That's because the solver is trying to conserve RAM and increase computational efficiency. Anything more you ask the solver to do is going to slow down the solution, and that's not a useful technique. It's better to find these quantities in the visualization or post-processing phase. Remember also that visualization is only one part of post-processing. Finding derived quantities is often a separate piece. 
unless of course these quantities are part of the visualization package. These are small points, so don't worry too much about that now. Now remember, values like pressure, temperature, and Mach number are often calculated in the post-processing phase. Now, the solver might explicitly have pressure and temperature depending on the formulation of the equations instead of energy. So for example, if our solver has given us densities, momentums, and energy, we could of course calculate pressure and temperature separately. Some choice of the equations will only give us pressure or temperature in the output files from the solver. And if you wanted to find energy, you would have to use the velocities and of course pressures and temperatures to find an energy. Mach numbers are usually never given at the end of the solver, and they're derived simply by finding, of course, the local speed of sound with temperature, with velocity, and then storing Mach numbers in a new variable within the visualization code. This is often done with a graphical user interface today, or you might write your own code to do this, especially for more complicated uh, derived functions. For example, if we assign or create a plot of streamlines, you are faced with the challenge of only knowing the field variables at discrete points. What do I mean? The streamlines are dependent on the velocity vector, but we only know components of the velocity vector at every grid point. So somehow we'll have to find an algorithm, a numerical algorithm, and program it into a code to find the equivalent streamlines. This is often done with some sort of marching algorithm in the code. Some visualization softwares let you actually control the, the variables or coefficients of these types of marching algorithms in space to calculate streamlines. And so if you just select the streamline quantity, it may not actually be the right streamline because of course the marching algorithm may not be converged to itself. Anyway, good visualization software will allow you to control these types of quantities. So you can see visualization is not just about creating the pictures and plots, it's also about understanding the numerical methods within them to make sure that you're calculating the right data. This is critical when designing aerospace vehicles so that after all the hard work of finding the solution, you can actually interpret it correctly. Now remember, values are only known at discrete points or cells. If it's a finite volume solver, it's usually at the cell or node. If it's finite element, it's of course at the nodes. If it's a finite difference approach, it's of course found at the grid points. So if you want to find variables or solutions that are not at your known values, you'd have to interpolate the data. This is what's done when you're creating a contour plot. Is of course, on the screen, a contour plot appears continuous, but it's not. Of course, it's really in a discrete framework of the computer, and the computer has automatically interpolated values between node grid points to find the contours and make them smooth on your screen. This is troubling because, of course, now your whole CFD solution could be corrupted and misrepresented if you use linear or second order interpolation when your code is fifth order accurate. So you should know the order of your visualization system. The interpolation of the results can also be very dangerous in general. For example, if you're extrapolating data, uh, then of course you can get a widely different solution. I never recommend that. But if you're interpolating it, you'll have to use a consistent interpolation scheme. Thankfully, there are amazing tools such as those contained in CFD solvers and the programs we're using in this class. Commercial codes handle all these issues automatically. Unfortunately, they do not always document all the exact algorithms they're using. This, of course, are trade secrets for that company. They don't want to give their competitor an advantage or disadvantage. Sometimes if you contact the engineers at the company directly, they'll be happy to talk about the algorithms and processes used in their codes, especially, of course, if you're a paying customer. But here in this class, let's concentrate on the math, the physics, and engineering involved in fluid dynamics. Know that these solvers, and especially visualization systems, can be very expensive if you're using commercial product. For example, in 2020, at the time of this writing, a tech plot license can easily be over $1,000 per user. So for example, if you're running a research group of 10 people and they're all using tech plot, it's very likely you'll have to pay for each person a one license per year. You can see how universities and companies try and minimize costs by trying to use free and open source software where possible. Because of course, as a professor in university, I wouldn't very much enjoy paying $10,000 per year for each tech plot license for each student. Let's now turn our attention to the ideas of qualitative versus quantitative data. Qualitative data or visualizations means that it's relate to or measures or is measured by the quality of something rather than its quantity. It's usually only useful to illustrate data or measurements or other things 
qualitatively if we want to show and emphasize a concept or physical phenomena. For example, a qualitative CFD plot might be one which we're trying to show that to people that say there's vortices rolling off a blade. You can make a three-dimensional plot. It looks very nice for that. But it doesn't tell us the actual physics and math and quantitative information. This is where quantitative type plotting comes to play and is very important in engineering math and science. Quantitative data and visualization will relate to measuring or measured by the quantity of something rather than its quality. That is, it's going to show the exact values. And there's different qualities of both these types of plots. There's high quality quantitative plots and what I would call low quality ones. And we'll show some examples of those. These, of course, the second category, are very useful as predictions and are quantified and comparable to measurement. Qualitative data is very unlikely to be that useful, especially in engineering applications, except for conveying some physical phenomena. Now, qualitative research will gather information that is not in a numerical form. For example, diary accounts, open-ended questionnaires, unstructured interviews, unstructured observations. This qualitative data is typically descriptive data and is such as harder to analyze than quantitative data. For example, if I went outside and just took pictures of smoke coming from our smokestacks, how would I be able to quantify things like velocities and vorticities from just pictures at one point? in space relative to the smoke. It'd be very, very difficult. If I really wanted to get quantitative data from, say, an exhaust of a chimney, I would have to put some measurement device in it. And that way, I can actually measure velocity and plot it and know the exact values in space and time. This is one of the most exam basic examples of qualitative versus quantitative data and its representation. Let's now look at some examples of qualitative versus quantitative data. Here's two particular examples. On the left is something that's more qualitative, and on the right is a, something that's more quantitative. This is from, of course, NASA, and we've looked at this case before. On the left, we look at so-called wing shape as a function of the span, and then we plotted the pressure coefficient on equivalent locations of the span on the right. Why is this data qualitative? Because there's no numerical data which I can find from it. I can never know what the value of CP is, at, say, for example, span of 0.5 and chord of 0.25, which is about here. I have no way of knowing what it is. But the great thing is I get a real good physical feeling of what is happening with the pressure coefficient on, say, the top of the blade, where in this case some little shock is forming or something. And we also get a really good shape of the blade. That is, it has some camber, goes out, remains constant, and comes back in near the tip of the wing. Neat. So from the qualitative plot, you can see that there is some value, but it's never as good as having quantitative plots of the equivalent case on the right. Now the quantitative plot you can see, and we've talked about these types of plots many times, so I won't re-describe it. You can see I have things like the chord, which is normalized, I have axi, and I have the experimental uh, excuse me, the exact solution from an analytical theory and a computed result from CFD as the dots. I have also have conditions of this particular case, and I've labeled axi. For example, from this type of line plot, I can go in and look at one particular data point, and I can try and find what the exact value is. So it has some numerical quality where I can back out the data. I can't do that on the left, it's impossible. This is the core difference between a quantitative and qualitative plot, and you can see why quantitative plots are preferred in engineering, especially. These plots might be improved by adding a more axi label. For example, if I want to find what the value is where my cursor is, it'll be very hard because I'll have to use a ruler, on paper at least, to interpolate between negative one and zero and find this value by drawing a line. Then I have to draw another horizontal line across and interpolate between 0.5 and 1. And so the precision of these plots is very low because I have no way of finding the exact values unless I do something tricky. Interpolation. I shouldn't have to work hard to understand the data as a reader or viewer of the presentation, right? It should be easy for me. Let's look at another example of a qualitative versus quantitative plot. This is of a backward facing step. On the right, you'll see contour and vector plots on the right, and these contain both qualitative and quantitative elements. So in fact, we can actually combine these types of plots to represent data and emphasize both its physics and its quantitative nature. In the upper part of the plot, we have the velocity vectors. 
you'll notice that these plots have no axis of x and y, so we really don't know the dimensions. You can see they'd be easily improved by adding a scale, axis, and units. The velocity vectors do have a magnitude, so the velocity to flow at some particular grid points is known, but only qualitatively, because we're never given a legend of what the magnitude of the vectors are. It'd be better to split these plots into three of contours of, say, u, v, and w. In the lower plot, we've shown contour lines. Now remember, these contour lines are interpolated from the grid points. So for example, this contour line where my cursor is represents 3.2. It's a mock contour. That's excellent. So we know the mock number only on this line is 3.2. To the this area of the line, we would say is the Mach number higher or lower. Well, this contour line is 3.4. So between 3.2 and 3.4, we know that the Mach number is somewhere between something greater than 3.2 and less than 3.4. We can make the same analysis between all the other contours. But wait, what if I want to know what the Mach number is where my cursor is? With this type of line contour plot, I have no way of estimating it. But it's a wonderful quantitative plot because I know exactly on every one of these lines, I know what the Mach number is. But I don't really know where it is in space because I have no spatial axis. There's probably a lot of other things I can do to improve these plots. And I hope that you take some time to think about what you might do to take this set of data and improve its representation and, of course, physical understanding. All you might know is really that there's a flow with some kind of boundary layer by looking at the velocity vectors. It remains uniform above the backward facing step. There's a amount of swirl behind it. And then you can see contours and Mach number to gauge these velocities. You can see that there's a lot of ways to visualize data. And there's some best practices and some mistakes. I just want to outline some of the basics that I've gained from my experience as a practitioner of computational fluid dynamics and seeing some good things and bad things coming out of my classes. And this is a learning opportunity. Always, always include legends within contour plots. If you have a contour plot without a legend, it's very hard to know what the values are. Try and do this even if it's seemingly impossible and the values are widely ranged. Your contour plot will only be qualitative and not quantitative if there's no contour plot. Try and avoid making contour plots and not using a particular legend for it. Your contour plot should always have legends. It should always have units, and it should always have as many contour bars as can be used for a piece of paper or screen in a presentation or journal article without being cluttered. Furthermore, if you have axes in your plots, avoid not labeling them. Every axis should have the variable like x and the units, such as meters. If it's non-dimensional, of course, write the non-dimensional value, like Reynolds number, write RE, but don't put units. Typically, non-dimensional numbers are not written in italic. Variables like X, U, P are written in italic, and you should be consistent between the labeling of your plots and the data and writing in the body of your paper. Do not include units if it's non-dimensional, of course. Always, always include units in the axis of plots or legends of contours if, of course, units are appropriate. By not having a unit, even if it's standard SI, then the plot is not going to be very useful to people in the future. It's a best practice and a good habit to develop now. Next, I would recommend that you annotate phys figures liberally. Adding even a minor text of an arrow right on the figure with descriptions or descriptions and accompanying text directly can easily create a greater understanding of the material. For example, if there's a certain flow phenomena or particular vortice as an example that you want to point out, put an arrow and label it on the plot and write something about it in the caption or body of the paper. This way you'll direct the reader or someone viewing the presentation to directly see it. And this is excellent in presentations when maybe someone in the audience only has 30 seconds to look at and understand a plot. That's not a lot of time for someone to view the data in say a professional conference. Absolutely quantify the error or uncertainty of the simulation. In experimental work, it is expected that experimentalists will include error bands when they create plots. In CFD, it is much harder to gauge the uncertainty or error in the simulation because, of course, the CFD only gives you one value. It doesn't tell you anything about the error. Thankfully, today, there's a growing field and use of error 
bars or uncertainty estimation from simulations. And this way, both the simulation and experiment can both have an error bar on the same plot. This is a very interesting way of doing things, but it's not typical. More typical is if you're comparing with an experiment that the experimental data will have error bars, and hopefully your CFD resides within the error bar for each part of the plot. It's not always possible to do this in CFD, but it is certainly a growing trend. And I really recommend that you at least try and do some uncertainty or sensitivity analysis of your CFD data. That way you can be competitive with the experimental folks. Let's talk a few about more points of best practices. Try and compare your visualizations with other visualization techniques. This is something that's not done typically, but if you have two visualization pieces of software, I would recommend at least in this experiment to see for your own use, to see how data is displayed with two different systems, but the same data set. For example, if I make the same contour plot with two different software packages using the same ranges and contour values, will they be the same? Honestly, more often than not, there'll be subtle or small differences. This is very disturbing, because if I have the same set of data, I should be able to consistently display it the same way. How can someone ever repeat your work, of course, if they cannot take the same data set and find the same plots? That's very disturbing, and it would, of course, be observed in many other fields beyond CFD. Now, you might also try and use validated visualization systems. Often, students, especially at the graduate level, are going to try and write some of their own derivations of, say, Q criterion or vorticity as two examples, but it's much easier to use a validated piece of software. For example, if you're finding Q criterion, which is a rather complicated function relative to simpler ones, like just, say, finding streamlines, it's much easier to do it with software. If you write your own software to do this, then it could be prone to errors, and this way you can reduce errors by using a validated set of code. Only if you don't own these programs should you really try and write your own visualization software, which is going to be as complicated as writing a CFD package. Many people love to make movies, and movies are fun, especially when you're trying to visualize data. Now if you make a movie and you present it in a conference, you should be absolutely sure it's going to be playing. There's been so many conferences where everybody's practiced for weeks and they go up and give their conference presentation, and of course the movie doesn't work. This has probably happened to you in a different field. So if you can tell the story without making a movie in a conference or professional presentation, I recommend you do so. Movies are really, honestly, only for fun. Even if your movie is uh, 60 frames per second, for example, and your screen is 60 frames per second, and it's progressing at 60 frames per second, that means, of course, that the simulation and the movie on the screen are in the same time. That is, we're seeing it in real time. Now, CFD data is often expensive to produce and create movies with. It's one of the most expensive visualizations there are. And all these visualization softwares, of course, make movies because everybody wants to do it with their time-dependent data. And it's usually done to check the, you know, to see if the physics of the solution is working correctly and there's nothing like strange happening temporally and spatially. It's for, more often than not, when you play a movie with your CFD data, it's not happening in the time that we exist in, of course. It might be happening at a much slower, much faster rate. And so I recommend writing the time on the movie. For example, in the first frame, it might be time equals zero seconds. And the next frame, it might be time equals 0.001 seconds etc. And this way, as the movie progresses, people can see the actual time of the simulation. They'll know it's not in the time, of course, at which we exist in and are progressing in. It could be very misleading to show a movie where the time is not calibrated with our own. It's very difficult to take a CFD simulation and convert it to in like what I would call real time, because of course you may not have enough data. For example, watching a 60-second movie off a high Reynolds number flow would produce a tremendous amount of data when we may not, as users, have the computer power or means to produce such a movie. And it may not have much value anyway. Generally, I would recommend not showing these types of qualitative results and focus on quantitative results, which are more excellent and good at explaining the evolution of the flow. And of course, the people in the scientific community will appreciate it more because of course they see numerical values. Some more best practices. If you're comparing with measurement data, always, always cite the experimental data of paper, presentation, slide with their names and dates. 
Performing experiments is extremely difficult. Performing excellent experiments that can be used for safety validation is even more difficult. And I would view that there's only a few dozen groups in the world that can produce with their facilities highly specialized experiments that can be used for good CFT validation. These data sets are expensive and time consuming to create, and they're not given freely away usually to groups. So even if you're lucky to get a high quality data set for validation of your code, it is very important to award credit where it is due. A little joke is that if you never want to work with an experimentalist again, please feel free not to cite them and use their data. Another thing which is tempting to do with many people is to hide problems with their data. For example, many simulations will often contain some kind of errors or problems, but maybe it's useful in some way. There could be regions which are maybe not correct of the flow, and these could be discarded for the use of publications. If these occur, or if there's some plotting or truncation of the data or some additional analysis, do not hide it from your users or readers. Be open and honest about these, and people will appreciate that, and they will gain respect and learn to trust you. It's better to be open and honest about having an error in a simulation and trying to correct it, or presenting the data and mentioning the error and simply asking people how you might fix it. This is the honest and ethical approach. To do anything else would be unethical. Now, examples could be of this is regions of the computational grid that are strange. Perhaps they have bad statistics. These should be reported. Some strange transient behavior in the flow. Maybe there's some initial oscillations that go away later, but they're unphysical. Convergence issues. If the solution is not fully converged, but it looks physically correct and relatively correct near experimental data, that should not be reported at all. Or if it is in, say, like an internal discussion, before publication, it should be discussed with your professors or supervisors in a company or other people in your CFD group. They may know how to fix it. And only showing portions of the contour plot where you think the data is correct and looks good. That should also be discarded. Try to avoid these things so that you don't cause a damage to your reputation. A few more points. Visualization software, especially contemporary software, has many features such as shadows and lighting. It's almost like setting up a light studio around a model in CAD. You might want to have nice shadows and things. I do not recommend this when trying to show your data, especially if you care about quantitative analysis and having quantitative data and its distribution. Uh, I think it's a little bit misleading to start in adding lights and shadows. Why? Because of course, especially when you're um, making contour plots, it actually changes the contour colors, and it's hard and takes away from the quantitative uh, nature of the data from the contour plot. It's actually sometimes distracting the people. Something might look too fancy, like in a product demo. We're not doing a product demo with CFD. We are trying to accurately predict the motion of fluids. So this is not Hollywood, perhaps. Or perhaps you're doing some simple simulation for Hollywood, and then of course it's okay. That's a different issue. Only use these so-called bells and whistle features if they help convey your message. This is usually very few cases for that. Finally, visualization is about showing your predictions. It's not about creating something flashy or fun or getting people's attention necessarily. These are distractions from your method. Do not live statistics. People have actually written a few books about how to live statistics. I don't even recommend reading these. This, of course, they'll lead to bad ethical behavior. It's easy to take statistics, especially with data from turbulence, and use different statistical quantities and only show those. This may represent your CFD simulation in a way and actually perhaps misrepresent your simulation to the users. Finally, try and use accurate and appropriate interpolation techniques in your visualization codes. It will be very important not to um, use different orders of interpolation, especially if you have higher order codes, as I already discussed. Let's talk about some contemporary challenges as of 2020 for 
visualization, and CFD. Now, there are many new research areas in computational fluid dynamics, and visualization is no exception. There are many people working in the area of visualization and performing research on it and writing more advanced visualization codes. And there's lots of challenges in this field, and I think it's a lot of fun to get involved in. One of the main problems in visualization is just dealing with a large amount of data from ever-growing data sets of CFD. The CFD codes and computers are run on are growing at a much faster rate than our ability to visualize and examine the data. So one comes and wonders, how can we extract meaningful design, flow, or other important aerospace information from terabytes or larger of data sets from a single simulation? This is very difficult because, of course, of the limited capabilities of our desktops. We might also ask, how can we optimize the vehicles? And how can we integrate a CFD solver with other computationally expensive, such as material or structural solvers, and experimental investigations? For example, our visualization system should not only be able to examine the computational fluid dynamic data sets, but also examine the experimental data sets and other types of solver data all seamlessly in a single environment to make aerospace design decisions. Now, we'll look at some of these contemporary challenges and how to solve them in the future and what research should be done according to the NASA 2030 CFD vision, which is a joint paper written by NASA um, and some set of contractors who are excellent in uh, CFD. We will have to be and effectively use a single high fidelity CFD simulation by 2030. That's the vision. And this single unsteady CFD simulation would be very complicated. It might contain other physics outside of typical solvers like combustion or acoustics or elasticity. We would have to solve for the full around complete aerospace simulation systems. For example, an entire aircraft with an engine perhaps a spacecraft launch with a rocket engine and chemistry and everything else going on a launch pad with moving bodies. These types of simulations might easily use at minimum 100 billion grid points, which is a lot less number of grid points than we're dealing with in this class at the time of this video. These types of simulations in the future are likely to be commonplace, and we'll have to have effective visualization systems to examine these data sets. And they'll be as important as the actual CFD solvers and codes and grids and everything else. It's also likely that higher order methods will be more and more likely used in CFD and higher and higher order methods will have to be used seamlessly in visualization so that the code and um, results can be examined properly. Of course, the computer hardware should also be improved and be explicitly created for this visualization on the high performance computers themselves. So this means many high performance computers are now integrating GPU cards or units on each blade of the machine. We'll talk more about this in the parallel computing part of the class. Thankfully, there's also still research being done in virtual reality so that these results can be examined on the supercomputer itself in a virtual environment to see the data three-dimensionally instead of a projection onto a 2D screen or piece of paper. Another important part and challenges of the future will be real-time processing and display using multiple high-performance computer or CFD simulations. That is, as the simulation is run, will it be possible to in see in real time from a single user, as the simulation is running, the data itself and examine data and trends. This is possible with very simple codes on desktops. It is another story when a high performance computing simulation is using tens of thousands of CPUs over hundreds of billions or even in the future trillions of grid points. It's going to be very difficult. If we can't do it in real time, of course, we want it to be quicker so that we can have CFD more so integrated in the design process in companies. And it has to be rapid and systematic without errors of thousands of CFD simulations for explorations of trends and experimental test data and design spaces. The main goal will be and remain to collect, synthesize, and interrogate this large array of data to make the engineering decisions hopefully in near real time. Unfortunately, you'll see, depending on the solver or visualization system or grid generation system, there are no standards for collection and analysis of CFD data. I'm hopeful that in the future, the community will come together and create standards. There are some standards, but they're just not widely and uniformly developed. It's not any different than having different languages for people, like Spanish and English and French. These are three different languages, and of course, we have to convert one language to the other to understand the data. This is the same thing in CFD, but with file formats.
Unfortunately, there's no robust method or techniques to reduce CFD simulation data or to create reduced order models. This is something we haven't talked about in the class and is a little bit outside the norm of CFD. It's a separate field. But if you have a large CFD data set, is it possible to create a reduced order or simplified model of the physics that can re be re-represented of the more complicated CFD simulation? There's no standard for this either. These types of things, of course, are very important for calculating something like engine component failure performance degradation. Additional contem contemporary challenges might be the merging of high fidelity CFD simulations with other aerodynamic data. CFD is not a standalone field anymore. It's becoming more and more multidisciplinary. Often, experts in CFD have picked up other fields, such as combustion, so they can run their CFD simulations with combustion and integrate it with other types of people in their company or organization. For example, wind tunnel tests and flight tests are expected to play a larger and larger role in the future. On the other hand, if CFD continues to advance, this may be diminished. Nonetheless, it's going to be important to merge excellent wind tunnel experiments with CFD data and their results in multidisciplinary simulations that contain structural dynamics, material properties, and fluid dynamics. And all these computations and databases, which are humongous in size, must be merged and understood seamlessly. This is part of the topic in 2020 of, of course, the idea of big data analysis, having many different types of data and integrating it in a way to understand it. Thankfully, in the mathematics community and the statistics community, there are more and more approaches being developed uh, for merging data automatically in making understanding of it. There must be new approaches for understanding and needed quantifying levels of uncertainties through these databases, eliminating erroneous error. When you have large experimental databases, we need to automatically remove erroneous points. In CFD, it's much less likely to have these types of errors, but in certain circumstances, they might occur. If we're combining the two databases from two different file formats for many simulations and experiments, it's going to be a major challenge in the future, and I'm sure that some students today will deal with this more so in the future than I have in my career. Finally, if you're reading about the details of this vision and contemporary challenges, you can go to the NASA Technical Report Server and type in and search for the NASA 2030 CFD vision. You can read this report in detail and get a better understanding of the contemporary challenges as of 2020 and how we might solve them through the next decade. Next time, we'll talk about and look at plots that are especially useful for computational fluid dynamics. Some will be less useful and some will be more useful because of the quantitative versus qualitative nature of the plots. Thankfully, through time, you'll learn which plots are best used to represent your data for different types of simulations and which might be best used to conveying this information to your audience. Honestly, you'll only be able to understand this through experience. We'll also show examples of plots and what might be improved on them to make them more understandable and what might have been minor mistakes. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.